The creatures, entities, and gods you're going to hear about today all come from the Bible. These are horrifying creations and powerful deities that might make you rethink everything you know about biblical texts. The Saintly Zombies Jesus Christ is a creator of zombies. You might say he has a little in common with Dr. Frankenstein. But before you call me a blasphemer, let me direct your attention to a very peculiar passage from the Gospel of Matthew. The passage reads, The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. No matter what your interpretation is, this passage is outright saying that saints were resurrected after Jesus and wandered out into the city. They obviously weren't Frankenstein monsters, but they were technically zombies, just without the whole eating brains thing. There are a few controversies surrounding this biblical passage. One of the biggest controversies is simple. Did it really happen? If the New Testament is 100% truth, like most Christians will tell you, the saints did indeed resurrect and go out into the city. But what did they do after that? What happened to the saints who were brought back to life but not ascended to heaven? Are they still around, 2,000 years old, and not a day over 40? It's one of those questions you only think about when your mind wanders in the shower after a long day. But it's a good question and could use an answer. If there are men alive today who saw Jesus, I'm sure people would like to know about it. Another question people have been asking for the last 2,000 years is this. Who exactly were the saints who were raised up from the dead? 17th century English minister Matthew Henry suggested they were the ancient patriarchs. Saint is a word that means holy one. The resurrected may have been the earlier characters from the Old Testament, like Abraham, Jacob, or Isaac. Or they may have been more recent saints like John the Baptist. Matthew Henry also tried to answer the question of where the zombie saints went after they rose. He suggested they only rose from the dead to bear witness to Christ's resurrection. Then they crawled back into their graves like going to bed after a bad sleepwalking incident. What are your thoughts on the holy walking dead? So many giants, they must be real. There are so many giants mentioned in the Bible that you start to get a feeling like ancient people knew giants existed. I'm talking flesh giants. The real deal. Meaty titans that towered above humans. The Bible isn't the only place where you'll find stories about tall men and women, but weirdly, mostly men. It's as if the giants sprouted from the ground, always male, like humongous human carrots. You've most likely heard of Goliath. You've undoubtedly learned of the Nephilim if you watch the channel a lot. But there are way more giants in the Bible, like the Anakim, the Amims, and the Zamzumims. In the forbidden books of the Bible, like the Book of Enoch, it's said that the giants were created when angels from heaven took human wives. The illicit breeding between the angelic beings and mortals created a race of giant monsters. In the Book of Genesis, it very specifically says that giants existed on the Earth Earth prior to Noah's flood. They're never mentioned again in Genesis, but do appear frequently throughout the rest of the Bible. Are you familiar with Og, king of Bashan? He was a giant, and his name appears in Deuteronomy and Joshua. Goliath appears in the book of Samuel. There are two other giants in the book of Samuel, Saph and Ishbibenob. And don't forget Lami, Goliath's brother, just briefly mentioned in the book of Chronicles. Just how big were these giants? Luckily for us, the Bible gets weirdly specific in some places. Og, king of Bashan, had a bed that was nine cubits long. A cubit isn't the most popular unit of measurement these days. It's equal to about a forearm, but that's not a great unit of measurement either. Let's say a cubit is 18 inches. That's most accurate. That means Og's bed was just over 13 feet long, so Og was probably about 10 or 11 feet tall. Goliath is described as being six cubits tall, only about nine feet. I say only, but let's be honest, nine feet tall is absolutely crazy. There is one aspect of being a biblical giant that you might not know about. It's a bit of a secret, so don't go around telling everyone. The Bible mentions that giants had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. They don't give a specific reason, but it is a defining characteristic of giants. If you ask me, it seems like an unnecessary detail, unless it's true. Why would it even be mentioned unless the giants did exist and they did have 12 digits on their hands and 12 on their feet? To find more information on the giant monsters of the Bible, you have to get extra biblical. What I mean is, you need to turn to the Apocrypha 
the forbidden books that have never been allowed in the Bible. Ancient manuscripts like the Book of Enoch and the Book of Giants give a more detailed backstory on the giants. Enoch claimed the giants were violent and destructive. They were also gigantic, like super gigantic. They supposedly stood 450 feet tall and ate humans like you might snack on popcorn. They ended up eating all the food and turned to cannibalism. This resulted in a giant cannibal civil war. Whoa, I didn't think I'd ever say that sentence out loud. By the time the flood came, it was a blessing in disguise. The giants had ruined the world. In the Book of Giants, it said that God sent another legendary monster to destroy them, just in case the flood didn't work. By the way, these giants are all considered Nephilim. God sent a beast known as Leviathan to get rid of them, but it didn't get them all. When the flood waters receded, Leviathan was dead and one giant remained. His name was Oya, Slayer of All Beasts. Seeing no other option, God sent the Archangel Raphael to do away with Oya once and for all. It's believed that Goliath, Og, and the other giants of the Bible were distant descendants of the Nephilim, like Oya. They shrunken quite a bit, from as tall as a skyscraper to only 9 or 10 feet. And now for number 8, but first it's shout out time. I wanted to give a big thank you to Rich Raz and Elizabeth Warman for supporting this channel. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos like this. His name was Legion. One of the most frightening demons I can think of appears in the Gospel of Mark. This passage always sends chills down my spine. When Jesus asked the demon what his name was, the demon answered by saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Isn't that just the creepiest thing? Legion wasn't just a demon, he was a whole legion of demons. Let's back it up here to the actual meeting between Jesus and the horrific beast of the damned. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus visits a region known as the Gerasenes. When he gets there, Jesus encounters a possessed man who had been living in a series of cave tombs. He was in a horrible agony, cutting himself on the stones and being generally crazy. But what are you expecting from a guy possessed by a demon whose name is Legion? Locals tried to tie this guy down, but he thrashed and threw them off. He seemed to possess the strength of a dozen men. Even when the people managed to get him in chains, he would break out of them like the Incredible Hulk. Then he fled into the tombs in the hills and shrieked all night like an agonized wolf. Jesus came up with a plan. There were so many demons possessing the man that Jesus couldn't just dispel them from his body, so Jesus used some pigs as vessels. On a nearby hillside, there were about 2,000 pigs. Jesus transferred the demons that made up Legion into the pigs. Then the pigs went squealing down the hillside and straight into the sea, where they drowned. Those poor pigs, what a moral dilemma. Leave one man possessed by 2,000 demons, or send 2,000 pigs into a river to drown. Which would you choose? In the end, the man was restored to his sanity. He asked to be one of Jesus' disciples, but Jesus told him to stick around and relay the story of his exorcism. The fallen angels waiting under the Euphrates River. Are demons truly fallen angels? If so, it would mean the possessed man in Gerasenes was filled with the unclean spirits of 2,000 heavenly beings that fell from grace. But what are demons really? There is a ton of lore surrounding angels, with stories having been written about them for thousands of years. But let's focus on what the Bible specifically says. Unfortunately, it might be a little disappointing. The thing is, nowhere in the Bible are fallen angels specifically identified as demons. It's only been through people's interpretations that this conclusion has been reached, and through the centuries, it's stuck. There are few demons in the Old Testament. Only in the four Gospels are demons spoken of in earnest. Jesus is usually exercising demons from people, or Jewish leaders are claiming Jesus had his own demon inside him. In most cases, demon is a word used for a spiritual force of evil. Unclean and unpleasant spirits that torment people are demons. In the Old Testament, the evil beings were more commonly referred to as gods. The Old Testament authors also used the word Azazel when referencing a demonic entity. What I find immensely interesting about this is that in the Book of Enoch, the angels that took human wives were led by their chief, 
named Azazel. When you start digging into a lot of these ancient books, you see names and themes repeated just like this. The fall of Satan is mentioned in the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Revelation. When Satan fell from heaven, one third of the angels in heaven followed him. It was a civil war, just like the one between the giants, but with less cannibalism. The Bible says the angels that followed Satan serve him to their ultimate demise. Biblical scholars say demons are just angels who fell with Satan. Because Satan was an angel himself, he too is one of the fallen. In the Gospel of Matthew, it's said that demons will depart as cursed and be placed in the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. In other words, demons will literally rot in hell. Did you know Satan might be here on Earth with us right now as you're watching this video? There are said to be four fallen angels, aka demons, currently bound in chains underneath the Euphrates River in Iraq. The topic comes up in the book of Revelation. When the sixth trumpet is blown during the apocalypse, the Bible says four angels will be released from their prison underneath the great river. The first of the fallen angels has been identified as Satan. The others don't have names, but believe me when I say they're destined to mess stuff up big time. Biblical writings claim that when the apocalypse is unleashed, these four fallen angels will be unshackled so that they can incite chaos. God is supposedly going to use them to enact a divine judgment upon the non-believers. God's going to let people be tormented by actual winged demons before the second coming of Christ. Lilith's Great Secret there is a passage in the King James Bible with a hidden meaning that's going to blow you away. First I'll tell you the passage, then I'll fill you in on why it's so shocking. Isaiah chapter 34 verse 14 says, The wild beasts of the desert shall also meet with the wild beasts of the island, and the satyr shall cry to his fellow. The screech owl also shall rest there and find for herself a place of rest. The term screech owl comes from the Hebrew word Lilith. It's a translation that the King James Bible took some liberties with. Some scholars say Lilith should really be translated as Night Monster in English. But according to Jewish folklore, Lilith was a woman. Lilith was the first wife of Adam, cast out of paradise for being too strong-minded. She's been called the first feminist. She predates Eve, and she isn't a screech owl at all. The reason she appears in that passage in Isaiah at all is because the Bible painted Lilith as a creature of the night, a beast living in the place of other beasts. Why? Because she didn't do what Adam told her to do. You won't find a bigger boys club than Christianity. They might as well have a sign on the door that reads no girls allowed, seeing as women have never been able to take positions of power in the church. If you think it's hard to elect a woman president, try electing a woman pope. And it all started with Lilith. According to ancient Jewish folklore, which predates Christian folklore, Lilith was in the original story of creation. God made Adam in his own image, but Adam was lonely, so God made Lilith, also from the dust and the earth. In the beginning, Adam and Lilith were perfectly equal. But the equality didn't last for very long. Lilith refused to be a doormat for Adam. Adam was upset because he wanted Lilith to perform wifely duties, if you catch my drift. When Lilith refused to submit, God got mad about it. She was cast from paradise forever and condemned to become a succubus. Oh no, not a succubus. In ancient legends, a succubus was a freakish creature that came to men under the cover of darkness and seduced them. Then a succubus would murder them. The succubus was seen as a soul-sucking monster, a sort of demon. In reality, the whole Lilith story has always been a way for church powers to denounce and demoralize powerful women, turning outspoken ladies into snarling creatures of the night. Once Lilith was out of the picture, God created Eve from the body of Adam, hoping the second time around, Adam would have a woman he could more easily control. And we all know how that turned out. What with the whole forbidden fruit and all. The Monsters of the Forbidden Books The two books of Esdras are not in the Bible. They are not considered scripture at all, except for in a handful of Orthodox and Episcopal Bibles. Most biblical scholars agree these books were written around the 2nd century AD. In the second book, there's a passage that I think you'll find quite disturbing. There is a good reason why the books aren't included in the Bible. The biggest issue is a historical one. 
In one Esdras, the reign of Persian king Artaxerxes is incorrectly dated. This is a fact as historians know exactly when he was the ruler of Persia. It was from 465 until 424 BC. The book places him as ruling before Cyrus the Great, 559 to 529, and Darius the First, 521 to 486, when in truth he ruled after them. This was likely done to help the narrative, but it's too confusing. Something like this with the dates all messed up could not be in the Bible. The content of the book focuses on the Jews returning from their Babylonian captivity under the ruthless leader Zerubbabel. It's in two Esdras that the disturbing passage can be found. This book is also sometimes known as the Jewish Apocalypse of Ezra. It's full of visions, most of them horrific. Scholars think whoever wrote the book did so shortly after the Romans destroyed the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD. The book reflects the destitution of the Jewish people following their brutal subjugation by the Romans. In a way, the Romans were the real monsters of the Bible. But just listen to this passage. There shall be chaos also in many places, and fire shall often break out, and the wild beasts shall roam beyond their haunts, and monstrous women shall bring forth monsters. How freaky is that? This is an apocalyptic vision of a future, presumably under Roman rule as predicted by the ancient authors. The book is saying that women will literally give birth to monsters. It gets even worse. The passage goes on to say, And salt water shall be found in the sweet, and all friends shall conquer one another. Then shall reason hide itself, and wisdom shall withdraw into its chamber, and it shall be sought by many, but shall not be found, and unrighteousness and unrestraint shall increase on earth. Wow, did that also give you goosebumps? The passage is saying that, to put things sweet and simply, Earth is doomed. It's trying to say that common sense will disappear while friends fight against one another, all while awful people take over the planet. Those awful people will come from the wombs of women, born as monsters instead of men. What are your thoughts on this? Do you think it speaks to what's happening today in the modern world? Let me know in the comments. The Great and Terrifying Baal We need to talk about Baal, one of the most prolifically worshipped gods of ancient Canaan and Phoenicia. During the time of the Book of Judges, the Jewish people also worshipped Baal, though perhaps not as fervently as their neighbours. The Bible tells us that during the reign of Ahab, Baal worship spread throughout Israel. What you might find most shocking is that Baal isn't technically a name. It's an ancient word that means Lord, sort of like how Yahweh means God, or how Allah means the God. He wasn't particularly frightening at first glance. Baal was a fertility deity, believed to be the one responsible for producing crops. People believed that without appeasing Baal, crops wouldn't grow. It was just like how the Maya believed that without Chark, the rain god, no rain would fall from the sky. This ancient deity's history is vague at best, with no scholar ever being able to retrace his origin to its very beginning. In the Canaanite mythology, Baal was said to be the son of Dagon, a super creepy fish god. Other myths have Baal being the son of El, a supreme deity who shacked up with Asherah, a sea goddess. El fell out of favor and was eventually replaced entirely by Baal, who was seen as the most powerful of all the deities. So powerful that he defeated Yam, god of the sea, and Mot, god of death. Baal's story is strikingly similar to the story of Zeus winning the seat of Olympus from his brothers. Zeus's brothers, Poseidon and Hades, were also gods of the sea and death. And just like Zeus's wife, Hera, who was something of a fertility goddess, Baal's consort was Ashtoreth, a fertility goddess. She was also Baal's sister, so there's that to chew on. Oh, and Baal's other consort was Anath, goddess of war. And you bet, she was also his sister. Worshipping Baal was not as straightforward as you might be thinking. People didn't just show up to a temple and say a few words of prayer. Priests led massive congregations that would make the loudest shouting preacher of late night TV seem tame by comparison. There were the sacrifices, sometimes human, perhaps sometimes child-related. These were horrible and shall not be spoken of. Then there were the more frequent ceremonies. People screamed, cried out, and rioted like they were at a heavy metal concert. 
These rituals often included injuries, with people practically flogging themselves while worked into a mad frenzy. As you can likely imagine, the Bible is not a big fan of Baal. Even before the Hebrews entered the Promised Land, God warned them against turning to idolatry. In Deuteronomy, God is adamant about paganism and especially Baal worship in Israel. The Jezebel Spirit the peak of Baal worship in Israel was during the reign of Ahab, like I mentioned before. But do you know who Ahab's wife was? Jezebel. Maybe you've heard of the Jezebel spirit before. It's a nasty term that seems to be making a comeback, like the term Karen, but worse. Jezebel makes her first grand appearance in the Book of Kings as a beautiful Phoenician princess. She was the daughter of Ithar Baal I, King of Tyre. She was also the great aunt of Dido, who was the Queen of Carthage. By the way, to learn more about Tyre, be sure to watch some of my recent videos. I just did an awesome deep dive on the real city's mythical history. Jezebel was responsible for trying to replace early Yahwism with Baalism. Jezebel wanted to get rid of Yahweh, the Jewish god, replacing all his temples with altars to Baal. King Ahab married her for this very reason. He too wanted to silence the prophets of Yahweh, and he was going to use Jezebel to do so. Jezebel, throughout the narrative in the Bible, was wicked and vile. She even murdered a man named Naboth when he refused to sell his vineyard to her husband. In the end, she died for her wickedness. Jezebel was thrown out of a window and trampled by a horse. When authorities tried to retrieve her body to give her a proper royal burial, they found most of her had been eaten by dogs. It was totally brutal, but it definitely wasn't the end. Jezebel made her second appearance in the Book of Revelation. Jezebel isn't alive again in Revelation. Instead, her name comes up as an insult. Someone is berating a man in Revelation and calls his wife a Jezebel. The insult was meant to disparage the guy's wife as a temptress and immoral sinner. It seems that between the Book of Kings and the Book of Revelation, Jezebel grew to be so hated that she became a curse word. In the ancient world, calling a woman a Jezebel was saying that she was energized by a demonic spirit. The idea has never died. People today still believe that Jezebel is alive as an evil spirit that can possess people, just like the demon Legion. The spirit of Jezebel has been called one of the archangels of the demonic realm by Christians. The next time you hear the term Jezebel spirit, now you'll know the history behind it. It's a lot meaner of a thing to say than most people might think. The church has even come up with five defining characteristics of a person with the spirit of Jezebel. They're manipulative, immoral, idolatrous, they incite fear, and they teach falsehoods. The Four Apocalyptic Beasts of Daniel in Chapter 7 of the Book of Daniel, Daniel recounts the vision given to him by God. It's the most notorious vision in the Bible, a glimpse of four great beasts written in gory detail. The beasts, while frightening themselves, are not real animals. Instead, they are representations of the four world empires that threaten the Israelites. Daniel's vision told him that although the empires would claim authority and rule, they would ultimately pass into history. And that's exactly what happened. It began on a dark and stormy night. In Daniel's vision, he looked out before him and saw the four winds of heaven churning the sea into an angry beast. As he watched the ocean raging and rioting, four monsters emerged from the blackened waters. The first of the beasts was like a lion but had the wings of an eagle. As Daniel watched in terror, the beast's wings were torn off and it stood erect on its hind legs. Later on, when an angel interpreted the dream to Daniel, he learned the beast was actually King Nebuchadnezzar II of Babylon. According to real history, Nebuchadnezzar ruled the Babylonian Empire from 605 to 562 BC. He was also the one who destroyed Jerusalem in 526 and took the Hebrews to Babylon where he enslaved them. One of those slaves was Daniel, the one who had the apocalyptic vision. According to the Bible, Nebuchadnezzar never submitted to God. Even though Daniel warned the king that he would go insane for seven years, the king didn't listen. Sure enough, God turned Nebuchadnezzar into a beast with long hair and fingernails. Nebuchadnezzar roamed the fields eating grass like an animal. The second beast Daniel saw rise from the ocean looked like a bear. It was raised up on one side, with three ribs clutched between its teeth. A great voice boomed from the sky, telling the beast that it must devour flesh until satisfied. 
Jeez, this whole thing is starting to sound like a horror movie. Later on, Daniel is told by the angel that the bear represented the Persian Empire. The three ribs in the beast's mouth represented the nations that Persia devoured, Lydia, Babylon, and Egypt. The third of the beasts looked like a leopard but had four bird wings on its back and four heads. It was a representation of Greece known for conquering with the swiftness of the leopard. But why in the world did it have four heads? That's a question with a complex answer. Each head represented a piece of Alexander the Great's fractured kingdom after his fall. When Alexander died in 323 BC, his generals, his own family, and his friends began to fight over control of his empire. If they had worked together, Together, they may have kept it intact, but they fought against one another, splintering Alexander's conquered lands. At the end of a series of conflicts between Alexander's generals, known as the Diadochi, four were left standing. Ptolemy, Antigonus, Cassander, and Seleucus. Each of them forged their own dynasty. Ptolemy took Egypt, Antigonus took Asia Minor, Cassander took Macedon, and Seleucus took Persia. The last beast was the most abhorrent. You can likely guess by now which empire it was meant to represent. With huge bronze claws, iron teeth, and ten horns, the beast devoured all within its sight and trampled the world under its feet. This creature was the Roman Empire, mightiest of all the powers of the ancient world. Stop feeding children to Molech. I think it's about time that people stop feeding their children to the god Molech. That's probably what the author of the Bible was thinking when he tried to warn people about Molech's evil influence. Of all the false gods and pagan deities you can read about in the Bible, Molech was the absolute worst. I mean the worst of the worst. If people start worshipping Molech again, we might as well abandon the earth. In the Bible, Molech was associated with the Canaanites. He was in the same religious pantheon as gods like Baal, Dagon, and Ashtoreth. According to Leviticus, families would force their children to pass through fire so that they might secure the favor of Molech. Some people throw a coin in a fountain for good luck. The Canaanites cooked their children in bonfires for good luck. You can see why Molech was such a horrible god. Leviticus chapter 18 verse 21 reads, You shall not give any of your children to offer them to Molech, and so profane the name of your god. This was a direct order from the big man upstairs not to incinerate your kids. When Moses was preparing the Israelites to enter Canaan, God warned them again. He said, do not engage in the evil practices of the people who live in this place. In the book of Genesis, when God tested Abraham, the test was straight out of the Molech playbook. Abraham commanded Isaac to be burned as an offering. It was exactly what Molech wanted people to do. God distinguished himself from Molech by stopping Abraham from going through with the sacrifice. This was how he proved himself as the good and merciful God rather than the bloodthirsty heathen God that was Molech. What I find extra interesting is that nowhere in the Bible is Molech said not to be a deity. He is admittedly a god, just not a very nice one. Could there be other gods out there just sitting around waiting for people to worship them again? Everything I just told you might be false, but maybe not. I'm sorry to do this to you, but I need to bring up something that scholars started to speculate in 1935. Some experts think Molech might not be a god, but rather the actual word for sacrifice in ancient Punic. The idea remains contested, but I just wanted to mention it because it's important to know these things. History isn't always crystal clear, even when it is written down. Here's another shocking fact. Molech only started to appear as a bull-headed monstrosity in the Middle Ages. Some suspect Molech was created by combining ancient accounts of Carthaginian child sacrifice and the Greek myth of Theseus and the Minotaur. History is really weird. Which dark and nefarious demon or demonic entity from the Bible do you find scariest of all? Let me know in the comments and thanks for watching. Be sure to stay tuned for extra content you might have missed. Biblical Dragons If you've ever wondered if there are dragons in the Bible, the answer is a resounding yes. Scripture employs the use of dragon imagery, although almost always as symbolic metaphors. Dragons are used in the Bible to describe sea monsters, great serpents, and even the devil himself. Wherever you look in the Bible, dragons are described as the enemy of God. 
In the Old Testament, the dragon is a primal nemesis of God and rises up against him only to be destroyed. The dragon then returns in the book of Revelation at the very end of days, once more facing off against the Creator. In the end, the dragon is defeated and cast down into darkness. The most traditional description of a dragon can be found in the book of Job. There is a creature called Leviathan, which Job says has eyes as red as the dawn. The Leviathan spits lightning from its mouth like flashes of fire, and smoke oozes from out its nostrils like steam rising off of a boiling pot. Job also says the immense strength of its neck strikes terror everywhere it goes, and that it has such hard and firm flesh that no worldly weapon can penetrate it. That sounds an awful lot like a dragon, a great beast that will make its appearance when the apocalypse eventually comes. Azazel Azazel began his existence as an angel but grew so corrupted that he turned into a demon. In Jewish literature, Azazel is such a nefarious beast that he corrupts humanity as the creator of sin. His name can be found all throughout the forbidden texts of the Bible, scripture that was never included into any official biblical renditions. His name only shows up officially in Leviticus 16. There's a single passage which says, Aaron shall cast lots over two goats, one for the Lord and the other for Azazel. The goat presented to the Lord is an offering, while the goat for Azazel will be bestowed with the sin of man and sent into the wilderness. Traditionally, this seems to represent Azazel as a scapegoat for humanity's sins. Where this rebellious angel gets really interesting is in the Apocrypha, the books of the Bible that were never included in the official canon. In the Book of Enoch, Azazel leads the civilizations of men and Nephilim in war and witchcraft before God flooded the earth. He is described as once being a beautiful angel, but he fell from grace and became a serpent or carrion bird. His only goal became to corrupt humanity, and he appeared to humans as a creature with red skin, yellow eyes, and wearing a goat skull helmet. He looked like a traditional demon, a red beast with a tail and a forked tongue. The Ophanim According to the Bible, a priest named Ezekiel and the king of Judah, Jehoiakim, were captured along with 10,000 Jews in the year 597 BC. These people were apprehended by invading Babylonians and exiled to the village of Tel Abib. Five years later, God showed himself to Ezekiel and bestowed upon him a prophetic vision. It was in this vision that Ezekiel was shown the Ophanim, a shocking creature of God. Ezekiel first witnesses a fiery cloud of lightning descending upon him from the north. Within the cloud are four blazing creatures. Each of the creatures resemble a human, but all of them have four faces. One of their faces is in fact human, but they also have the face of an ox, a lion, and an eagle. Even more terrifying is that these beings are completely covered with eyeballs, all the way from the tops of their heads down to their hooved feet. Their hands, which are very much like ours, are tucked inside of their four wings. One set of their wings stretched outwards, connecting them to their counterparts, but the other two wrapped around their bodies. The creatures seen by Ezekiel in his vision may seem demonic in nature, but they were really angelic beings sent by God. They are later identified in the Bible as the cherubim, the guardians of the throne of the Creator. However, it's beyond the frightening cherubim that Ezekiel spots the Ophanim. He describes them as wheels beneath the feet of these angelic creatures. They gleamed like topaz, spinning and changing direction as the cherubim moved. They were also completely filled with eyes. These bizarre creatures supposedly make up the chariot of God's throne and are steered by the same Holy Spirit which guides the equally strange cherubim, the phoenix. The phoenix, a fiery bird of rebirth, shows up in one Jewish translation of the Old Testament. It's also found in a Greek version of the Old Testament from the 3rd century BC. There are two main passages. One says, I shall die with my nest and I shall multiply my days as the phoenix. The other says, and like the phoenix, I shall have a long life. Clearly, the authors of the Old Testament believed at least in the existence of the phoenix. As you may already know, the phoenix is a legendary bird from many different mythologies. Legend has it that every 500 years, the phoenix dies in an eruption of flames and then is reborn from its very own ashes. 
In the first century AD, Clement of Rome, one of the first to support what would become the Roman Catholic Church, used the phoenix in his epistle to the Corinthians as a symbol of the resurrection of Jesus. And in the Talmud, the phoenix was said to be the only animal which would not eat the forbidden fruit, and because of its obedience, God blessed the phoenix with immortality. The Cockatrice The cockatrice is a bizarre mythical animal that became exceptionally popular in the Middle Ages. It was a horrible creature that a lot of people really believed in. In mythology, the cockatrice is a hybrid between a serpent and a chicken. It was believed to resemble a type of serpent called a basilisk, with two wings, the head of a rooster, and the lower half of a serpent. In legends, the cockatrice can kill people simply by looking at them. If it touched or breathed on someone, it would kill them instantly. It was poisonous, fierce, and had razor-sharp talons like a rooster. In medieval bestiaries, ancient guides on mythical monsters, it was said the only animal immune to the deathly stare of the cockatrice was the weasel. It was also thought that the crow of a rooster would kill these creatures. Oddly enough, the first mention of a cockatrice is in the Bible. In the Old Testament, the cockatrice lives in holes in the ground, reproduces by laying eggs, and bites people to death. In Jeremiah, there's a passage that says, For behold, I will send serpents and cockatrices among you, and they shall bite you, saith the Lord. It seems the cockatrice was such a popular monster, even 2,000 years ago, that God used it as a threat. It was considered just as monstrous and deadly as a viper. Some historians even believe the cockatrice was a real animal, and that it may have been a venomous snake that lived in the Sinai region. Would you rather have the head of an eagle and the body of a lion, or the head of a lion and the body of an eagle? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, hit that subscribe button. Beelzebub. Beelzebub was transformed to Beelzebul by the Jews, which is made up of two different words, Baal and Zebul. Baal, which was the name of the Canaanite fertility god in the Old Testament, was also a heathen deity supposedly worshipped by a disturbed cult who sacrificed children in his honor. The second word that makes up this demon's name is Zebul, which means exalted dwelling. It's only when we put these two words together that they create Beelzebub, or Beelzebul, ruler of demons, lord of dung, and god of filth. Beelzebub has been around for a very long time, since at least the days of the Philistines. At the ancient site of Ekron, archaeologists found golden images of flies, along with the name of the demon. This has led to the belief that the Philistines worshipped Beelzebub as a lord of flies, a deity that ruled over the most annoying insects in the world. His name changed multiple times, altered slightly by the Jews and then the Greeks, and by the time the Old Testament was written, Beelzebub was seen as a particularly contemptible false idol. The Lord of Flies was seen as disgusting, and so his name became used in religious texts to describe Satan. We see Beelzebub referenced multiple times throughout the Bible, in Matthew and Mark. There's one passage in which Jesus heals a man possessed by a demon that has caused him to become mute and blind. When the people are astonished at the miracle, the Pharisees show up to deny Jesus as working through God. Instead, the Pharisees claims Jesus got his power from Beelzebub, the prince of the demons, the locusts. When the fifth trumpet is blown in Revelation, it begins what are known as the Three Woe Judgments. These are great plagues of sorrow and distress. Horrible woes, far worse than all that happened in the years of tribulation beforehand, after the first four trumpets were blown. In the book of Revelation, the fifth trumpet sets a star descending from heaven to the earth. The star is in fact a fallen angel by the name of Apollyon, an unspeakable demon who has in his possession the key to the abyss. The abyss is also described as the bottomless pit, and Apollyon goes by another name, Abaddon, which translates to destroyer. When the fallen angel unlocks the abyss, that's when one of the most terrifying demonic creatures in the Bible comes to scour the world. From the abyss come a multitude of locusts. However, these aren't any ordinary locusts. They're terrifying demon locusts. They are said to have tails like scorpions, and can sting people, and they were ordered by God to torment all the non-believers left alive on the planet. The locusts are instructed to torture humans, but told to leave the crops and the vegetation alone. Their only purpose is to cause immense pain and suffering, and to make things worse, humans won't die during this tribulation, 
They will be kept alive to experience the agony these creatures bring with them. For years, a horrifying plague of locusts will torture humanity with stings even more painful than those of the worst scorpions. And the whole time, nobody will be permitted to die and escape their anguish. Magoth. There is very little mention of demonic forces in the Bible. Most of the demons we know by name came from various works afterward. For example, the whole idea of there being princes of hell came from work published in the centuries following the rise of Christianity in Europe. Many of the most popular tales of demons and horrible monsters didn't come about until the medieval days. It's from the Book of Sacred Magic of Abramelin the Mage, published between 1362 AD and 1458 AD, that we see the supposed hierarchy of demons in hell. There are four principal demons who rule the infernal lands, Lucifer, Leviathan, Satan, and Belial. In ancient biblical texts, these are generally considered to be the same entity. However, through the centuries, they all became individual demons and lords of hell. Underneath the four crowned princes of hell are the sub-demons. One of them is named Magoth, believed to have gotten his name from the French word Magoth, used to describe an evil creature. Magoth may also have roots in the word Magus, meaning wizard. Whatever the case, the Book of Sacred Magic describes Magoth as a master of necromancy. He has powers of illusion, he can transform a person's appearance, and he's entirely evil. Magoth is just one example of how material from the Bible became exaggerated in the centuries that followed its publication. Dozens of demons that never appeared in any original religious scripture became popular symbols and dark entities feared by Christians. The first and second beasts of Daniel. In the book of Daniel, he is given a vision of the end of days. His prophetic vision is believed to be a metaphor for the greatest empires of the 6th century BC. These empires are also seen by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon in his dream early on in the book, and later in Daniel 7, he describes the empires in the form of beasts. The vision comes to Daniel in a dream. It starts on a windy night, with Daniel looking out at a turbulent sea. The waves crash and the foam sprays the night sky, and suddenly four great beasts emerge from the dark waters. The first beast is a lion with the wings of an eagle. As Daniel looks on, the wings are ripped off the beast, and the creature stands on its hind legs like a man. Then a human heart is placed inside of the beast's chest. It's only later that an angel of God tells Daniel the first beast is a representation of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. The beast is the king's true form, and he may only rise on his own feet when he accepts the true nature of God. The second beast rises from the ocean like a bear. The great bear is clutching three ribs in its teeth, and a voice whispers to Daniel that the beast has come to devour flesh until it's fully satisfied. The second beast is likely a representation of the Medo-Persian Empire, with the three ribs in its mouth representing Lydia, Babylon, and Egypt, all of which were devoured by the empire. The third and fourth beasts of Daniel. In Daniel's vision of apocalyptic horror, the third beast rises from the sea like a leopard, with four wings like a bird and four heads. Daniel is told that the third beast has been given authority to rule over the land. It's almost certainly a representation of Greece, the great empire known for its swiftness and successful conquest. The four heads of the leopard represent the four fractions of Greece following the death of Alexander the Great and the division of his kingdom. Daniel then witnesses the final beast. This one is the most dreadful, the most frightening, and by far the most powerful. It has huge iron teeth, and Daniel has no living animal to compare it to. It's a horrible thing which devours its victims and tramples all that's left on the ground beneath its huge feet. It's an annihilator of prey, a great amalgamation of all the beasts of the world with ten horns rearing out of its ugly head. This final beast is a representation of the Roman Empire, what would have been the mightiest empire known to Daniel in the days his book was written. Which of these horrible creatures do you find the most terrifying? Let us know in the comments below, and be sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.